Hi, it is now almost August 1st, 2021. And I guess what I'm doing at this point is chronicling just a personal narrative to help people understand what happened in the United States. Certainly this last year uh, will be remembered as a lost year. And as I speak today, uh, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. It appears that there's been a cycle where countries all over the world decided to try to work together to combat the pandemic called COVID-19. They were able to mitigate the virus. And what happened was over time, variants of the virus were able to, despite efforts, were able to multiply in enough numbers so that all of the efforts of gov governments worldwide, including developing and transporting a vaccine and creating secure supply chains for the transportation of, the, of those vaccines, at this point, it appears that a lot of that work has been for naught, has been futile. And this is now called a quote unquote Delta variant. And as a result of this mutation, the question is whether or not the whole world is going to be caught up in yet another bitter political cycle that pits people against each other. On the one side, people that believe the virus is being overblown in order to solidify government control. And on the other side, people who believe that it's common sense to maximize cooperation in the face of a deadly virus. That's probably going to be the staid historical version of what's happening, of, or of what's happened over the last year. And there's no doubt in my mind that when we look at or when other people study the United States during this time period, that we in, the, in this country will be seen in the exact same way that Americans view Germans between the 1930s and the 1940s under the Adolf Hitler regime. And the reason I say that is because this pattern of a strong man ruler coming in and being favored by a significant portion of the population is fairly typical. And it's happened before, it's happened all over the world because if you think about it, human nature is fairly consistent regardless of whether you're Chinese, Russian, American. And you also have to remember that all these different borders are human made and therefore artificial. And we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of propaganda convincing people that this flag has this number of values and, you know, this kind of, I suppose, motif. And that flag over there has those kinds of values and those kinds of motifs and those kinds of whatever it is. When in fact, you know, again, because human nature is fairly consistent. All systems of governance are, sus are, are susceptible to the same kinds of issues. And so certainly that the last president that we've had has made enough comments against immigrants, enough comments against Muslims. Uh, you know, you, you, go down, you go down the list and it won't be too difficult to make for another country's intelligence services to make a comparison to you know, Adolf Hitler's Germany. And my fear is that we're going to once again miss the lessons of history. And of course, the you know, lessons of history are always difficult to realize, even though again, they shouldn't be because human nature is fairly consistent. But putting the last president, president's comments in context, 
you have to remember those anti-immigrant comments were made only after other politicians. Remember, the last president was a businessman, was not a politician, was not a career politician. He donated to politicians, but he himself was not a politician. And so when he came into power and made those anti-immigrant statements, it was only after other politicians, including former uh, directors of intelligence agencies, essentially failed to create a workable immigration system. The legislature had passed, I believe, either one or two types of omnibus bills that were, that had intended to resolve the need for seasonal labor, the need for immigrants in general, the need to balance international obligations with respect to refugees, with security, with domestic, uh, compet you know, with domestic, I suppose was just domestic opposition to outsiders coming in and competing for the similar or the same jobs. And this has been going on for 40 years. And if you can't fix something after 40 years, there's no doubt that because human nature is the same everywhere, regardless of ethnicity, religion, and so on, that the consequences should be fairly apparent. And again, the consequence here has been that the United States has had a quote unquote strong man ruler. How did that, what happened in those 40 years? One of the problems is that in a large country, it has always, it has always been difficult to get everyone on the same page. And so a lot, actually anybody attempting to create a common value system is going to have to embellish a little bit. The first reason is because it's almost impossible to gain enough knowledge, specific knowledge, detailed knowledge of another person's culture or of another person's history within one lifetime. In order to do that, you would have to speak multiple languages. You would have to travel. And remember, travel, budget travel, low cost travel, is something that's fairly new. If you go back and look at travel a while ago, you know, it was sort of um, only something for the elites. It was not something that any, just anybody could do. And if you wanted to travel as recently as, I suppose, 50 years ago, you would have had to have a, quite a bit of money. And if you're an American, most likely you would, we would only have two weeks to go somewhere. And most likely you would be staying at a resort somewhere that would be distanced from the general population. In other words, you would be moving from one artificial system to another artificial system. And so it shouldn't surprise people that the attempts of all countries to bring people together so far have failed simply because not enough people have been able to travel and mix in with the, with the local population. The United Nations was supposed to be an attempt to bridge this obvious gap. In other words, you would have an agency that would be dedicated to Essentially, it would be mimicking the television show Star Trek that would be in a position where it would be able to bring people together who were interested in this kind of cross-cultural understanding and would be in a position to create translations of knowledge that would be eventually memorialized in a way that would allow institutional knowledge to be created and passed down from generation to generation. That's what people mean when they say institutional knowledge. They're talking about an institution that can be passed down from generation to generation and then modified in the process in order to create what we consider to be progress. And we haven't, we, we, we've not even begun that process. Partly 
because we, we haven't had any United Nations for that long. Uh, we had a League of Nations that failed. But for the most part, the world that, that I live in is a post-World War II world. So what that really means is that it's a world that was imprinted upon me from 1945 onwards. So, you know, about 75 years. Not even one lifetime. And when you talk about the marketing efforts to bring people together, to get them on the same page so that they can have, they can share a cohesive narrative, what you'll notice is that it was actually easier to do back in the day. If you look at older movies, Frank Capra would be an example of a director that would make these universally human movies. It was easier to bring people together, at least in the, in the English language. Partly because, again, the United States was able to set its own terms and conditions post-World War II. It was able to enjoy a fairly stable currency and so on and so forth. But what you notice is that Frank Capra's success was, and, and quite frankly, any writer's or any, anyone's success, has been based on this idea of reaching into and discovering the universal, and then essentially translating that for as many people as possible. And what I notice sitting here is that despite the billions of dollars that have been invested in developing a shared narrative through social media, through newspapers, through any sort of medium, what I notice is that we were having a harder time, despite more knowledge, in creating the same kinds of universal themes that by now should be easier with time. So on the one hand, we have this problem where we have had a situation where having more knowledge of it has actually hindered us from understanding the universal. At the same time, in the old days, our knowledge of the universal was probably a bit too simplistic, but it worked because human nature is for the most part simplistic on some fundamental level. And so when you try to piece together what's happened, what you've had is a post-World War II framework that sincerely believed in the principle of divide and govern. In other words, that sincerely believed that human beings were not capable of living together to the extent that they did not share either the same race or the same religion. And that post-World War II framework has, of course, gone, went off the rails. It wasn't just a post-World War II framework. It was pre-World War II as well. Because under Germany, what was happening was not just, well, before the concentration camps, before the genocide, was segregation, were Jewish ghettos. And so throughout history, the powers that be, the ones that want a stable environment for investment and for the economic progress, have sincerely believed that human beings are different and cannot get along unless they share something universal or obvious, like race or religion. If it's not going to be religion, then you can see how race can be manipulated into an ideology of superiority by whoever happens to control the medium. That's been the real tragedy of being a human being in my lifetime. It's first of all, not realizing earlier that this entire system that I've been a part of has been based on segregation. And as a result, has failed to create a cohesive narrative. Because if segregation 
whether based on race or religion, is going to be the fundamental, intractable characteristic that underpins everything that you do, everything that follows will fail in terms of social cohesion. Because if the foundation of a house has, has flawed, it doesn't matter how nice the house looks. It doesn't matter how nice every house on your block looks. Eventually, it will crumble. If there's an earthquake, if there's a disaster of some sort, from an economic perspective, if there's a recession, for example, or from a countrywide perspective, if there's a lot of debt that's being held by foreign bondholders, or a lot of claims being made on the resources of your country by foreigners, quote unquote outsiders. And when you understand our lifetimes within that context, in other words, within the context of having to create a social narrative that is guaranteed to fail over time if exposed to enough shocks and, en and enough incompetence, no matter how well-meaning, everything starts to make a little bit more sense. Even though that's a simplistic way of looking at it. But it's probably true on some fundamental level. And so when you're studying this country, you're studying how it was able to fail so spectacularly in such a short period of time, despite having material wealth, despite having the ability to set the terms and conditions of, for the most part, global trade, certainly from 1945 until 2001, and probably thereafter as well. When you're looking at all these different issues, It's important to realize that we, the human beings of this generation, were set up to fail. That's the first thing you want to remember when you're studying us. We were set up to fail. We were set up to believe. We were set up to try to come together in a time period where we were literally unable to gain personal knowledge of other cultures in other countries because it was too expensive to travel until recently. And as a result, what we knew about people in other countries and what we knew about other cultures was all hearsay and thus unreliable. And there just weren't enough people out there within my lifetime that were able to invest the time in trying to pull together the visionaries of our generation. You really would have to have an interest just in humanity, in order to create the beginning of a cohesive narrative, which would be, at this point, a cautionary tale. You would have to have somebody that would be interested in both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, and then take that knowledge, and then try to figure out how the knowledge of these men would apply Worldwide, In other words, take what is specific and then try to understand it within a universal context. And again, if you begin to realize that the trading houses that have enjoyed concentration of wealth for quite some time, sincerely believed that we would be better off, ordinary people, if under segregation, because they'd seen so much, so many problems under what they would consider to be desegregation. If you look at it from that perspective, it will be a little bit easier to understand everything about us, this generation of human beings. That's sort of the the outline, the foundation of attempting to understand us and why we failed miserably as despite having more knowledge. And I wanted to use that to also show that within a large country where security is divided among local, state, and federal governments, in other words, you have 
local police departments. Above them, you would have, you know, essentially the FBI, National Police Department. And then in between, you've got so many different law enforcement agencies that it's almost impossible to keep track of it. You know, you have, um, just in California, you would have within, say, the jurisdiction within, say, five miles of where I'm standing right now would fall under at least four different, probably, quite frankly, probably 10 different, 10 different agencies, right? You've got a local sheriff, Santa Clara County. You've got a city police. That's two. Or, that's two. Then you've got national jurisdiction on, under the FBI. Then you've got Homeland Security, which was made post 9-11. They try to bring all these different systems, data systems, technological standards together and under one cohesive unit. And then on top of all that, in case of, a, of an emergency, you also have the potential for the military to come in under quote unquote martial law. That would involve different groups as well. It could be the National Guard, it could be the army. I mean, that's just the start. Uh, if I go out to the nearby freeway, it's possible that a California Highway Patrol would also have jurisdiction. So right away, we've got state, local, federal. When you think about it, think about the complexity that has resulted as, as a result, as a consequence of segregation. Again, it becomes even easier to understand why a competitor to the United States that did not suffer from so many, from A, segregation, or, and, and B, so many different decentralized law enforcement mechanisms would succeed. In other words, it's easier, easier to see that a more simple system would, at least initially, would be easier to manage, especially in terms of economic expectations, as compared with an insanely complex system, which would require about 40 years of education, both formal and informal, in order to really get a handle on. And that takes us back to the COVID epidemic, the pandemic. What we're really seeing is, well, first of all, I haven't seen any, anybody, not one person, uh, explain the rivalries between the two philosophical houses properly. Within the United States, because of this decentralized system, there is both a private sector and a public sector, and they compete with each other. It's a good thing. But with this pandemic, which is a public health issue, the reason this, is, this issue has become so intense is because both sides are, in a sense, correct. And we don't have the social cohesion necessary to bring them together. Because in part, we were set up to fail. Remember that segregation is not just racial and religious by design. It's also been the private sector segregating itself from public sector regulation. And so when you think about this pandemic, you're looking at one side that says, I do not believe that the government, given all these different agencies, is going to be able to do what it says it's going to do. I prefer to listen to my doctor or my private system and go from there. And if my doctor says that I'm a healthy person, I'm not a senior citizen, then if I want to choose to get a vaccine, should be entirely up to me because I'm paying into a private system that is maybe backstopped by a patchwork of public regulations, but it's still a private system that I'm paying into. And as a result, it is an infringement upon my rights for a non, for a public actor or public agency to come in and tell me what to do with my body. And even if my doctor decides to tell me that I should have the vaccine, again, because I've chosen, chosen to be part of a private system within a country that prides itself on a 
nice mix of both public and private investment and therefore public and private actors, that choice ultimately remains with me. You can see how this argument would fail in Europe or in any country that had a national publicly, publicly subsidized, well, fully subsidized healthcare system. Because in that case, this, these arguments would not apply. In a public health system, where the government controls the healthy dispension of healthcare, if the government says, well, we, the government, and in fact, the entire public, we're all in this, in this together, and we're under a, a fully public healthcare system. And of course, we collect taxes to make the system work, but ultimately, post-World War II, the whole world runs on debt, and therefore, the credibility of each government that's running not only the military, but civilian systems as well. And so, if we are the ones in charge of maintaining credibility among our debt holders, among our bondholders, and among the, the international community, we have to not only listen to you, the voter, but the, but the international banking system that also funds our way of life. And so in the, because we are essentially giving you healthcare, not for free, but under this system that is based on a post-World War II globalized funding mechanism among allies, among currencies, among insurance, that is, that is as complex as the domestic systems in the most countries, we are justified in telling you that you must have a vaccine if you want to enjoy the benefits of public life. And you can see how this argument within, say, the UK, which has a national health service, would make perfect sense. Because if somebody, even if they're paying privately for a private doctor, gets sick, that person is, if they are they have made the wrong decision if they happen to have a, a genome or whatever that made them more susceptible to the virus than they, than they actually thought or expected, then suddenly that person would be in, say, the ICU. And because there are no truly, purely private healthcare systems, that person would be taxing a system that is not designed for a full-blown pandemic. You can, that's easier to understand if you think about a scenario where you have, well, this is the scenario, where you have limited number of vaccines available for everyone all over the world, the global issue. And so if you choose, if you under a private system made a choice, then essentially you're taking that vaccine depending on where you are and the availability of that vaccine from somebody else. Now, that might be an argument to not get vaccinated. I see that. But you can also transfer that into just the health, number of healthcare beds. You have a hospital that's paid for under a private system, but ultimately, if that hospital becomes fully within in the middle of a pandemic, uh, full capacity, then obviously there's going to be a mechanism for the public and private sectors to work together to deal with the overflow. Under a national healthcare system, it goes without saying that the cooperation would be expected as everyone involved would be under the jurisdiction of a public healthcare system. It's a little bit harder to make that argument when you have a long-standing tradition of competition between private and public, especially in a country where most people, sorry, I shouldn't say most, but a significant number of people do not believe in the integrity of their government officials, which would explain, again, not just Donald Trump, a businessman who became president, but all the way back in, I believe, 1993 or 1996, another businessman, Ross Perot, who was also extremely popular, though he did not, I believe he did not win any electoral votes. 
In other words, he was extremely popular outside the formal system. So you see this pattern of fluctuations within the United States based on whether the private sector is doing better than the public sector and vice versa. You see credibility going up and down based on whether these systems are able to generate an outcome that, is, that maximizes efficacy for everyone involved. Because at the end of the day, right, you know, we don't want a society that where everyone's stuck inside their private homes and needs a bodyguard or a fence protecting those homes. So there's always been this idea of the public good, but of course there's always been debate on how to maximize the public good in a way that doesn't create either massive debt or the sublimation or subordination of the individual. Now, we've covered a, we're trying to cover the big picture here. And so we've covered this competition between private and public this idea that having a private choice entitles you to some measure of freedom because you're not restricted to only one option. And if you're used to having options, the idea of somebody on the other side telling you what to do with your body will seem like an imposition that is asking for too much, an, an, an undue imposition, despite the fact that we have public health care, in other words, a public safety issue involved. And all that ultimately goes back to the credibility of the government. If we had government officials that had credibility, in other words, you can easily imagine a, if you're living under General Eisenhower as president, and General Eisenhower, who's just helped win World War II, along with George Marshall, goes on television or goes on the radio and says, I'm asking all, all Americans to get the vaccine because I believe it's in the best interest of the country. You can imagine quite easily that you would probably hit an 80 to 90% success rate voluntarily. But you can also see that that credibility is based on well it's based on getting things done and it's based on having somebody being able to push somebody in both the military and and the presidency who has integrity and i don't think that any, anyone in america believes today that most politicians have integrity remember that a decentralized system makes it easier to hide things as well. If you have 15 different data systems running on different operating systems that are controlled by different agencies, not, none of whom want to give up control over their own data, you can easily see how it's a lot easier, easier to hide within a decentralized system. And so when you look back, you can also see that we were set up to fail. Remember, we were set up to fail. If you have a, a desegregated system that does not maximize integrity, you're going to have a world run by criminals that will then activate a desire for more law and order, for a strong man that will then capture innocent people in the process, who will probably leave the country that they're in to the extent that they're part of a dragnet that's, unjusti that's unjustified. And that bleeding of talent, which has happened throughout every time period in human history, will have its own consequences. As some countries begin to look like better places to live, and other countries begin to implement measures to try to stop their people from leaving. And the way this is done is usually financial. If, you know, most people, 
don't have the privilege of just leaving their country. They have to have money to do it. And so, as a result, you have, again, within this decentralized law enforcement system or fragmented law enforcement system under a paradigm that is based on segregation. In other words, the decentralization is actually based on segregating different people and then trying to bring them all together under some sort of Frankenstein type of security umbrella, which of course doesn't work. It's a bit like, I mentioned Frankenstein, a bit like chopping off your own body and then assigning, you know, let's say you cut up your body in 15 pieces and somehow you're still alive because you don't think your body's gonna get along with each other, right? All the pieces just don't somehow fit perfectly. And then you assign 15 different doctors to put, put the body back together, all of whom have their own computer systems and their own rules that all overlap under, a, under one chief physician. Is that going to be a system that works if every single one of those doctors lacks and or does not have the highest standards of both competence and integrity. Now imagine those 15 doctors putting together Frankenstein. And remember, they not only, let's assume they have both the competence and the integrity. Well, again, they might have that for one generation. They still have to pass on that knowledge to the next generation. So you have a real problem with long-term results. And let's say, but as these doctors are trying to maintain this Frankenstein, that they're competing with another patient who's in the same position, but he only has one doctor who is both competent and who has integrity. Now that doctor still has a timeline problem, the secession problem, but it's fairly easy to see that that other doctor who's operating under one data system, under one security system, under one essentially system, is going to have an easier time getting things done. Even though it might not be as interesting of a story. Because if you have 15 doctors, you've got 15 stories. If you have one doctor, especially one that might be a little bit staid in personality, you can see how, at least initially, those 15 doctors, especially if they have competence, are going to present an image of having a superior system versus the doctor who's on a single standard or versus the one doctor. And you can see how those 15 different stories would create a society that would value diversity more than the other doctor, the one who's on a single standard, who's more homogenous. But you can also see that if those 15 doctors at any point in time are not on the same page, that what you're dealing with is an unwieldy, essentially monster. That will not be able to function. So that is the situation that we're in today. In order to have maintained the system that we're in, both political, educational, civilian, non-civilian. We had to have, at least in the United States, political integrity that would be able to bind together the private sector and the public sector in a cohesive unit when disaster would strike or when you had a position where some sort of threat to the foundation became apparent. And since we haven't had that in quite some time, in probably at least 40 years actually, probably since 1981, what you are going to look at is a generation of people that were set up to fail. And I want you to understand that when you study the United States and when you study the entire world. Now, what, where does anyone go from here? Do we want that one doctor? Do we want 
a homogenous, a more homogenous system. I don't know. Like I said, it certainly, it certainly has less risk of confusion and miscommunication to have one doctor. But you still have the same secession problems. And in fact, if you, if the 15 doctors die in a staggered way, it might be easier to replace them over time and still maintain institutional knowledge. But the other real problem is that in addition to being set up to fail, what people don't understand is that success sets people up to fail. Let me say that again. Success, politically, sets people up to fail. Because when you're successful politically, especially if you are an empire that can set to terms of global trade or can print its own currency or can or have an insurance system that will forgive mistakes as best as possible. The way that political success maintains itself is through compromise. And you can see that over time, if you are those 15 doctors and you give them unlimited funding, funding, you can see a system where you wouldn't have to make difficult decisions. You would simply pay people off. In other words, you, if you, and that's actually what's going on now with the stimulus package. If you have a system in place where you have a lot of money, you don't have to make difficult decisions. Poor people have to make decisions every day. Rich people, not so much. They have to manage. That's the type of decision making, but it's not the same thing. You have a lot more to manage. The more things you have, the more you have to manage. The more administrative tasks you have. So the other problem is, under the system where we've been set up to fail, we've also at the same time had too much, had too much money in a sense, which is going to be odd when you start to study us because it's not gonna look like we have too much money. About half the country has less than $4,000 in a bank. About half the country isn't poor, but one emergency, one earthquake, one foundational crack away from poverty. And so if you are too successful of a political system, you can simply buy out your enemies in order to buy yourself time. But if, if you don't spend that time that you've bought attempting to fix the foundational cracks, attempting to actually understand the root causes of the problems that forced you to buy out these people in the first place, this faction, you're going to be, in a sense, held hostage to one of those, any of those 15 doctors that tells a good story. And if you really think about it, if you're a particularly devious doctor working on that Frankenstein, you can see how you might be tempted to even make up a story about your body part, about your piece of the pie, in order to convince the other 14 doctors to give you a raise or to give you special benefits. You can see how if you have 15 different data systems, it might even be easier to convince or mislead the other 14 doctors about the type of work you're doing and so on and so forth. And no one's really gonna know until all the body parts are put together and they've had some time to function. And then ever so slowly, there's a crack it's not as if you can go back, take back the benefits you've given. You may even have a hard time figuring out which of those pieces is at fault because it's all a connected system. How do you know it's that doctor? That, that's probably, you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even think to yourself that it would be the doctor that you've all just agreed to praise or give a raise to. That would be the last person you would suspect. But if it turns out that over time, the time you've just bought, because you're able to print money, 
and not have to actually resolve fundamental issues or not pay attention to the foundation, you can see how if you do discover the doctor that you just gave a benefit to has been lying to you, that every one of your 14 colleagues will now come under a cloud of suspicion. That the entire system that you've been a part of, which requires cooperation from those 15 all participants, local, state, federal, within that, five different agencies, all of which are created because they're dealing with segregated problems. The problem, the problem isn't that they're going to fix segregation. The problem is that they're going to create another umbrella that's going to attempt to deal with an offshoot within this system of segregation. So let's say you've got a problem within a system of segregation. What you're dealing with is an offshoot, a fragment. And so you say, well, one day we've got nothing but residential roads, so that's fine, the sheriff can handle it. Next day, there's a national highway program, so you think to yourself, well, the federal police don't patrol the highways, we don't want the police agency that's, that's covering residential roads to also cover this new system. So what we're going to do is well, we're going to set up another agency to cover this new system. You keep going and going, and suddenly those 15 doctors might even become 20 or 25 or even more because none of it's cohesive. Remember, the idea of segregation is that it's simple to manage. That's why it's so attractive. You don't have to understand anything outside of your own backyard. And it's, it's attractive because you can also say that you're a specialist. You specialize in policing residential roads. So some other agency covers the highways. You might have to do it sometimes if there's a disaster of some sort and say the hospital beds are full or the police cars are somewhere else. So you might know a little bit about what's going on sometimes, but ultimately you're dealing with a segregated, segregated system of fragmentation that leads to specialization. Then you've got to manage all that together. How do you do that without an Eisenhower? Somebody that has the trust of, the, of most of the country. How do you do that, say, after Nixon? has lost the trust of the entire country. Well, after Nixon, you get somebody called Jimmy Carter to come in, who has nothing but integrity. And to give you an idea of how long we've been having these problems, Jimmy Carter, which who may have been the last president that had integrity, was a one-term president, wasn't able to have two terms. Usually the incumbent tends to win. So if you're studying us in 2021, and you're, you're comparing us to the Germans, which you should, and you will. Just remember, if you are under a system that is set up to fail, you will be in that same bucket of history as all the rest of us who failed. There won't really be much you can do about it. And that is going to be the lesson for you which is why so many people, like myself, disdain debt. Because I guess we've always been suspicious of the marketing messages that we've been told, whether from teachers or politicians. And that makes sense if, like me, you grew up under multiple presidents in secession that lacked integrity. And as I'm saying these things, I now realize why I've always been attracted to the old things, the old movies, the old writers, because they had integrity. And in my lifetime, no one's had that on, on the national political scale, except for Jimmy Carter. And I was too young to, when I was in the United States to listen to him speak. And when I heard him speak in video clips at the Presidential Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, I was just taken aback. That was the first time in my lifetime that I'd heard a president speaking in a way that made me proud to be a human being. The first time in my 40s of a president that was only in office for one term when I was a child. When you study us in 2021 and you're comparing us to the Germans, 
in the 1930s and 40s, remember that we were set up to fail. And if you disdain debt like I do, you have a little bit more of an opportunity to try to find another place that might not have, that might not have, that might not have as deep a crack in its foundation. Even though we all understand that any system of government, because it's based on human nature, will have the same problems in the end. And ultimately, you just have to take a leap of faith and do the best you can. And try to go to a place where when you listen to a politician, that the politician understands that he or she has an obligation not just to his own citizens or her citizens, but to the human race. Because if you're not able to bring together not only the different factions that have developed long before you came into power, but if they're not able to show the whole world, which would include your citizens, that you have an idea of what binds human beings together across history. If you can't do that, you will fail because you haven't yet understood that underneath every single political system, regardless of whether it's capitalism or whatever the name is, communism or socialism or whatnot, that every single system will have a crack in its foundation called human nature.